When we have a rush to the exits, that is out of financial assets and into real assets, like farmland and oil wells and gold and silver, the people trying to get through are gonna outnumber or, or just swamp the size of the exits. They're not gonna be able to get through in time and that's gonna to lead to panic buying. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2021 Silver Krugerrands for only 365 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today, our good friend John Rubino from dollarcollapse.com. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, Elijah, good to talk to you again. With respect to the news, we just got the jobs numbers out. Precious metals popped because they were kind of disappointing numbers. Your perspective on what is causing this? A lot of people are saying it's the Delta variant. Um, where are you seeing the economy going in the near future? I guess with respect to these jobs numbers, what is your perspective? Well, we've got two big cross currents out there right now. And one is that the economy is slowing down. Everybody was um, expecting just a rip roaring GDP growth in uh, the next couple of quarters. And um, that's not happening. Um, employment, as you mentioned, is not nearly as strong as everybody expected. And consumer spending is down and consumer confidence has cratered on a lot of um, a lot of surveys. Um, and house prices are up, but home sales are, are not soaring anymore. Um, so it, it's looking like a, a, an economic slowdown in a lot of ways at the same time that inflation is still high and rising because of supply constraints. In other words, things that aren't connected to economic growth. Um, it's just hard to get things shipped from one country to another these days. And, uh, and a lot of companies can't find enough workers in order to um, make good on all the sales that they're getting. So they're having to scale back. Um, so you've, you've got what looks like the beginnings of a classic period of stagflation happening here where, where growth is um, underperforming. It's kind of slow. It's not as good as, um, as most people would like it to be. At the same time, prices are rising at a rate that, uh, that implies overheating. Um, and, you know, the last time that happened was the 1970s. And I think the 1970s are becoming a better and better guide to what we're going through right now, because I, I know almost all your listeners are way too old <laughs> to remember the 1970s. Uh, so I'll, I'll just give a quick recap. Uh, that was a time when um, when there was instability in the financial markets, in part because the U.S. was borrowing and spending way too much and inflation was starting to pick up and we we're having all kinds of geopolitical turmoil. And, and that was leading people to worry about financial stability and they were selling the dollar. So the dollar was tanking and inflation was at double digit levels. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people were worried that the whole global financial system was not going to be able to survive it. Uh, and of course, towards the end, gold and silver went through the roof because those are the assets that people usually pile into when thoughts of, um, you know, non-survivability of the global financial market start um, appearing in newspapers and, and on the TV news. Um, so this feels a lot like that, um, in, including the geopolitical side of that. What this, what with Afghanistan being such a mess and everything, and China apparently getting ready to take Taiwan back, and Russia uh, wondering whether now is the time to uh, to reestablish its control over Ukraine. You know, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the uh, the geopolitical sphere, and there isn't a lot of confidence that the U.S. is going to be able to deal with it. Um, that tends to create doubts about our financial system, the value of government bonds, the value of the dollar, et cetera, et cetera, um, just as happened in the 1970s. So a lot of this stuff is, is very familiar to people who are old enough to remember those previous days. Uh, and you know, if that's the case, if we're actually heading into something like the 1970s, only by the way, with much worse finances, we were actually in pretty good shape financially back then, although it didn't seem it at the time. And now we're not in good, financial shape. So we're a, a lot more fragile 
Uh, so if we get the kind of the combination of uh, financial instability and geopolitical turmoil, uh, it is completely possible that this financial system does not survive it in its current state. So this is a really interesting and scary inflection point um, in the uh, you know the life cycle of this current financial system, and I think we should all be paying attention to it. Now, the Fed has said that, you know, come the end of the year, they could start uh, tapering. Now, with these disappointing jobs numbers, do you think that's actually going to happen? Well, it's less likely now. Actually, it was never really likely because uh, the Fed has tried this a few times, right? They um, they start tightening or at least uh, scale back their ease. And then the financial markets freak out and the Fed has to take it all back and go back to being super easy again uh, because... We are so financially fragile because we're so over leveraged that even a little slowdown in the amount of new credit that's being created, new currency that's uh, being dumped into the banking system, even a little slowdown in the growth of those things is enough to uh, to send us off a financial cliff. And the guys in charge kind of know that, they, but they also know that if they continue to flood the system with new currency, we'll get inflation, which we're getting now, right? Um, even by the government's accounting, inflation is at crisis levels, you know, four, five, six percent inflation. That's the kind of thing that has traditionally led the Fed to aggressively tighten. And yet we've got those numbers coming out right now. And the Fed is at, at best, at its most aggressive, it's saying, well, maybe we'll ease back on the uh, the money creation and the credit creation sometime in 2022. And we don't see higher interest rates for a while after, you know, they're, they're being really wishy-washy about it because they know they don't have a choice. You know, if they, if they try to actually tighten the way they ought to in the face of 6% inflation, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down. So they're in a box. There's really nothing they can do that makes um, makes this system sustainable. In other words, there's no way to get from here to um, steady, sustainable, organic growth um, at a level that would put enough people to work to um, to get current politicians reelected. <laughs> you know, there's no way to get from here to there. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't sympathize with the Fed because they brought this on. You know, they're the arsonists who stopped the, or started the fire and who are now expected to put the fire out and hope to get credit for it um, because nobody remembers that they started the fire, it's not gonna work for them. You know, there's no way to fix the current situation. And um, because of that from here, who really knows what happens? Uh, you know, we, we, all, only, the only thing you can say with any real certainty is that instability will be the result of the mistakes that we've made in the past and that we continue to make, but there are no good things can from, come from this at all, I don't think. You're mentioning about how, yeah, the Fed probably won't taper now because of these disappointing jobs numbers and how this is really setting up for stagflation because of how much money creation the Fed is doing. Now, can you expand more on the other situations that are paralleling what we saw in the 1970s, especially geopolitically? In the 1970s, we were just coming out of the Vietnam War, which is a was this huge mess, uh, no matter how you looked at it. And um, one of the interesting parallels is that the end of the Vietnam War um, happened with us trying to get out of Saigon um, in a really chaotic way. And you have all these iconic um, photos now of people hanging on to helicopters as the helicopters take off from the uh, the roof of the embassy in Saigon because nobody wanted to be left behind when the communists flooded in and took over the country. Now we've got that same thing in Afghanistan. You know, these same images, only it's big troop transport airplanes that the people are ha ha um, hanging off of. Uh, and it's that same kind of chaos and that same kind of humiliation for the U.S. You know, we definitely should have left Afghanistan, but we should have done it 19 years ago, um, ideally. And if we were going to wait as long as we did, we should have taken our people out first, then our equipment, and then the soldiers. And everybody knows that. Everybody sees it. But we did it in the wrong order. And, uh, and we look incompetent. And this is very important from the financial perspective because a fiat currency like the US dollar isn't a real thing. It's just a psychological construct. 
And it only exists, it only has value if everybody chooses to agree that it has value by trusting the people who are in charge of managing it to be competent and honest. And that's a tough sell right now. You know, we do not look competent and honest at the, uh, the upper reaches of the U.S. government. Uh, and that's liable to reverberate throughout the financial system when, you know, the, the handful of countries that are still buying U.S. treasuries decide not to do it anymore and decide to dump what they've got or with, um, you know, investors around the world no longer wanting to hold dollars and choosing to hold some other currency or more intelligently, um, older forms of money like gold and silver, you know, and, and it's really important to look at charts of gold and silver towards the end of the 1970s. If we're going to use that as an analog, um, in 1979 and 1980, gold and silver just went straight up. They just rocketed. So you had that kind of parabolic move at the end of a longer, less dramatic move. Uh, and I, I think that something like that is probably coming somewhere out there. You can't say anything about the timing, you know, whether it's this week or five years from now, when you, uh, you finally get that kind of cathartic blow off in fear about, about the future, uh, which leads to a huge jump in gold and silver. But I, I think we're setting up for something like that because in the, you know, the headline aspects um, of today's world, we're very similar to the 1970s with the, you know, the exception being that we're in way worse shape financially, which means the crises, at least in the financial sphere that flow from what we're doing right now, ought to be a lot more serious. So, uh, you know, it's, it's great for the gold story. And it's, it's always been basically the gold and silver story that we were going to continue to borrow huge amounts of money. We're, we were going to continue to print um, increasing numbers of dollars until people figured out that um, inflation is our explicit public policy and that and then they bailed on the currencies because of that. You know, all, all the big fiat currencies, not just the dollar, are in the same boat. So when we have a global, when we have a rush to the exits, uh, that is out of financial assets and into real assets, like farmland and oil wells and gold and silver, the people trying to get through are going to outnumber or, or just swamp the size of the exits. They're not going to be able to get through in time. And that's going to lead to panic buying, finally, of the assets that are seen as antidotes to the financial crisis that's approaching. Uh, and we're setting up for that. You know, we were putting all the pieces in place for a huge flood of terrified money into real things that governments can't just inflate away. And, and then the question becomes, how do you want to allocate your investable capital among hard assets? In other words, you, you made the decision you don't want financial assets anymore, or you don't want as many. And you want to move into things that will tend to do well in a stagflationary or hyperinflationary or otherwise chaotic environment. Um, then what do you want to do? Do you want to buy a rental house? Do you want to buy farmland? Um, do you want to buy a bunch of oil company stocks or cryptocurrencies um, or gold and silver bullion or gold and silver miners? You know, this is uh, this is tricky in its own right, but it's it's also very interesting. You know, this is a fun kind of asset allocation challenge. And I think that'll be a big topic of conversation going forward. You know, what exactly do you want once you've made the decision to get out of uh, bank stocks and government bonds and bank accounts with lots of dollars in them? And uh, I, you know, I, I welcome that conversation because that at least has an optimistic side to it. You know, so much of what we talk about is, oh, we're making all these mistakes and horrible things are going to flow from it. And, and, oh, people are going to be laid off from work and we're liable to have more war because of geopolitical turmoil that flows from financial turmoil. That's all really depressing. But, um, hey, silver might go to $500 an ounce from here. How do we want to buy silver? See, that's an optimistic, actually kind of happy thought process. And I'm way more comfortable over there than I am with all this gloom and doom stuff. So I'm looking forward to that being the main topic of conversation in the world, which I think it will be pretty soon. I think it's so interesting. Yeah. Looking at the positive side and what can we actually do about this and how can we protect ourselves 
for the coming crisis, if that is going to happen. Now, if we look at the what happened uh, today, we're recording this on Friday, we saw quite a jump in both gold and silver. It's They've kind of uh, made back up their losses we've seen in the last month. Your perspective on what is happening currently in precious metals? Gold and silver almost alone had a kind of a taper tantrum for a while there. The Fed was making noises like they were going to taper. You know, they, they had some of their talking heads go out and, and launch those trial balloons. Uh, gold and silver responded to that because tapering involves somewhat higher interest rates, somewhs slower economic growth, less cash sloshing around out there. And so people sold off precious metals. They didn't sell off anything else. So there was there was kind of a uh, almost contest out there to see who was right, right? Or, or stocks and bonds, right? Because they're doing well, which means no taper. Or gold and silver, right? Because they're tanking, which means probable taper. Well, it turns out stocks and bonds were right this time. The Fed took back most of the taper stuff right away, you know, and, and they, they still kind of have it on their agenda, but it's way out in the future and it's way milder than people were afraid of. So gold and silver just snapped back to where they were uh, before all this taper talk started. Now, it's looking like easy money to the horizon, even though, um, you know, this inflation thing could change that calculus if we go from four or five or six to seven or eight or nine on the CPI. Uh, I don't think there's any choice but to do something about that. But barring that, um, it, it's, you know, multi-trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see, um, extremely low interest rates basically to the horizon. So, uh, that's a really good environment for precious metals. And I think people are just recognizing that. And there was a lot of um, bargain buying there for a while where um, mining stocks were cheap, gold and silver, especially silver. Silver had a, a harder time of it than gold. So it got cheaper relative to gold just lately, although they both went down. So there were well, a lot of people just stepped in and, and bought at this level and they pushed it back up. So I don't necessarily know if that means clear sailing from here on out, because there's still that that stock market crash out there because stocks are, are wildly overvalued. And a lot of other assets are, too, you know, SPACs <laughs> and the um, non fungible tokens, NFTs, you know, those things are, are crazy expensive, along with a lot of other collectibles. So we're liable to see a big correction in the things that have gotten way, way ahead of valuation, you know, tech stocks, a lot of other kinds of equities and a lot of these these new acronyms in this cycle. And if that happens, that could pull down gold and silver. So I don't think it's a straight shot from here to $5,000 gold and $200 silver. They'll get to those levels, but I, I think, you know, one big correction maybe is still in the works. And I'm worried about that because uh, as we've seen from the past stock market um, debacles out there, uh, they tend to pull down everything, including gold and silver when, when big tech stocks tank. So that's still out there waiting to happen. So that, that should kind of temper your enthusiasm for gold and mining stocks. You should still be um, stacking, you know, dollar cost average without fail every month by a little bit more gold and silver or a, a few more gold and silver mining stocks. Uh, but don't jump with both feet into this just because it, you know, precious metals came back from a correction because we very possibly got another big correction out there at some point. Uh, but by all means, keep stacking. You know, the guys who are in best shape right now are the ones who did that, the preppers of the world who um, bought their real assets. You know, they've got uh, some food stored away. They've got some land that um, that grows food. They, um, they probably own some gold and silver and some guns with plenty of ammo. You know, they're, they're looking at all this and going, okay, you know, I'm ready for this. And uh, so we kind of want to be those people if we can in a general sense. And uh, my, my focus is mainly on the, the financial side of, side of it, you know, buy lots of gold and silver. But the rest of that stuff, the lifestyle changes that you would normally put into place if you were worried about the future are still the things you want to be doing, maybe more so now than ever. So gold and silver have a role to play, uh, but so do all of these other things. And uh, I, I think the fact that this has gone on long, longer than it should have has given a lot of people some breathing room in which to put a, a, a good strategy in place for being ready when things get really crazy. All right. Well, John Rubino, we really appreciate your time today and all your insights. I guess before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers and where people can find you online? 
Yeah, I'm, I run dollarcollapse.com. So just come on over. And uh, if, if you want to join the mailing list, you uh, have a button there at the top. You can click on, put your email address in there. And uh, I'll just send you whatever I publish going forward for free. And we don't use your um, your personal information for anything other than that one thing where we send you stuff. All right. Any last thoughts you'd like to add, John? Just that things do seem really dark out there between the uh, the pandemic, which never seems to go away and, and uh, global chaos and, and now financial instability. I, I think that can really depress a lot of people. You know, it's hard to look at the world and not feel terrified by it. So I, I think the whole investment thesis of what do I put my money into that will actually go up while all of this stuff is going on is really psychologically helpful. So try to think of uh, all this crazy gloom and doom stuff as an investment thesis and, um, and use it to motivate you to allocate assets that might win going forward. And then you've got that to look forward to. You know, you can make a lot of money if you do this right. Fantastic. Well, the website is dollarcollapse.com. John Rubino, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thanks, Elijah. This week's special with Miles Franklin Precious Metal Investments. 2021 Silver Krugerrands for only 365 over spot. Call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.